Man, if you're new today, we started a new series last week. And it's called Pray Like This. It's uh, We're walking through the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. If you want to turn there, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, most of you have got the uh, Lord's Prayer memorized. If not, we have bookmarks with it on there as well. But uh, we're going to be walking through the first line today. And we're in Matthew Chapter 6, verse 9, in just a moment. Um, I was uh, at the driving range one day, and, and you're thinking, why? And uh, I, I, uh, I'm not a, a good golfer. I think it was for one of my uh, Mark Turns 40 golf tournaments. And I was there just trying to get some hacks in before, uh, before the tournament. And uh, this guy walks up to me as I'm hitting, and he said, uh, do you want to be any good, or do you want to just hack around? And I thought, man, that's a kind of a put-me-down kind of uh, thing. But what he was saying was, uh, if you want to be better than you are, then you need to uh, let somebody teach you that's better at it than you are. He happened to be the golf pro at the uh, driving range, so maybe there was money in it for him. Uh, but it was not my goal to be good at, at golf. I just didn't want to embarrass myself. And so there's a difference. But if I want to be a mechanic, I want to learn from the best mechanic. If I want to learn to sing, I want to get somebody that's a good singer and be with them. Whatever I want to be good at, whether it's basketball or tennis or whatever, I want to get with somebody that's better at it than I am uh, so I can learn from them. This brings us to the Lord's Prayer. In Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, we have that the disciples came to him and they said, uh, Lord, teach us to pray. And they saw an intimacy that Jesus had with his heavenly father and the power that came from his prayer. And so they went to the one who had that intimate connection and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And we are looking at how Jesus taught the disciples and how he teaches us today to pray. Uh, we, uh, I can tell you this, in my years as a follower of Jesus and as a minister, I can tell you that the two things that are uh, must be for any child of God to grow in their faith is the word, the scriptures, the Bible, and prayer, okay? The word and prayer. These are the two things. I've seen people read the Bible and do prayers but not grow, but I've not seen anybody who's growing who's neglecting the word and prayer. So the word and prayer are the two things that are uh, major for you. And we're dealing in this area of prayer because we don't want to be just a church that prays. We want to be a praying church, and there's a difference in those. Uh, notice what Jesus does not deal with in the Sermon on the Mount when he was asked how to pray. Number one, he doesn't deal with the physical posture. Do you kneel? Do you raise your hands? Do you close your eyes? Can you pray with your eyes open? Uh, how, how is it? Jesus doesn't deal with that. We see people lifting their hands. We see people kneeling. We see people on their face. So there's many different postures to pray. He doesn't go over the time and the day you're supposed to pray. 
Is it the morning? Is it the evening? Is it three times a day like Daniel? Uh, when are you supposed to pray? Jesus doesn't deal with that. The scriptures say pray without ceasing, but uh, formal times, it, it, he doesn't go over that. He doesn't go over how long you should pray. He doesn't go over, should it be five minutes? Should it be 30 minutes? Should it be all day long? And I guess the answer is yes, if we're to pray without ceasing. But uh, he doesn't go over how long you should pray. He doesn't go over how you should look when you, uh, uh, your attire when you pray. Uh, you don't have to have a suit on. You don't have to uh, be barefoot. You know, he doesn't go over these things. He, he also doesn't go over who you should pray with. Uh, Brett, last week when he kicked it off, he says, uh, you know, our father, our, uh, the, the plural, we are called to pray individually. We're called to pray corporately. We see this in the scriptures. So Jesus does go over all these things. He's dealing with the heart as you come to pray. And uh, he deals with this, our father. And many of us see the um, Lord's Prayer. You memorized it maybe in the uh, locker room. Uh, your football team is going out, your basketball team. Or we think, oh, it's a good luck charm if I have the Lord's Prayer. Or it's, uh, it's going to help me out business-wise. It's going to help me out whatever. Uh, and so we quote the Lord's Prayer, hoping we're going to get something in return from that. I, I thought before, because you got to know, I, uh, locker room prayers, there's probably a good chance you're saying the Lord's Prayer, the other team is saying the Lord's Prayer, and so who's going to win in that? God just sits back and says, I'm going to enjoy a good game at this point. And so it's not a good luck charm. And uh, we call it pray like this. And uh, what we're looking at is in Matthew chapter 6, let me just read part of verse 9. It says this, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. Now, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to cover line by line of the Lord's Prayer. But when he says pray like this, what he's doing is he's not laying out a ritualistic prayer for you. He's laying out a guide. These need to be the areas of your prayer life right here. And today we're going to deal with our Father in heaven because this is the foundation and groundwork of everything we're going to be looking at. Uh, each week, like I say, we're going to cover one line. In the United States, there are currently 18 million children who are growing up in fatherless homes. That's one in four in our country are growing up in fatherless home. Now, fatherlessness uh, is for many reasons. Some uh, dads have died. Some, there's been divorce, and the father is still very much involved with his kids, but he's not in the home. And then, uh, but you know as well as I do, we live in a day where men have abandoned what they are called to do as fathers. And so we're dealing with a epidemic in our country. And with this epidemic, they're saying, these are uh, statistics out there, that kids that grow up in fatherless homes are more prone to mental and emotional struggles, to educational struggles, more prone to drugs and alcohol abuse, more prone to teen pregnancy, many become what our country labels as 
drains on society instead of contributors. And they say that fatherlessness has a great deal to do with this. Now, my personal story, I grew up in a fatherless home. I, my mom eventually remarried, and uh, I had a stepdad. And, uh, but my father was dying of cancer when I was born. I was 15 months old, and he passed away. And uh, I never in my life, 65 years, have called anybody dad. It's just not been in my vocabulary. And because of this, I questioned my manhood. And not that I was effeminate or something. I questioned my manhood in when are you a man? What does it look like to be a true man? I struggled with these issues. I also struggled with abandonment issues. If my dad has left and, and doesn't mean, doesn't, I'll get this out. It doesn't matter why they're gone. Maybe they died. But you as a child deal with abandonment issues that are there. And I did not be, uh, understand what it meant to be a father until I was one. And that's scary uh, because it takes more to get a driver's license than to be a dad. And uh, that scares me uh, in our country. Um, but, and I somewhat struggled with this heavenly father thing. Uh, you know, he is the heavenly father. And so I struggled with what that really meant. And I, I still somewhat struggle. But I've come, overcome many things because I learned about fatherhood. I understand the uh, father-son relationship with the father. But many of you today may be struggling with that. And I want to try to help you as we pray. And the scripture says this, Our Father in heaven, this sets the foundation for where we're going. Now, let me teach you just a, a moment. Um, Jesus spoke Aramaic, okay? He spoke Aramaic, that was his uh, vernacular, and then he also spoke Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek, but so when we have the words of Jesus in the Greek, the word Father doesn't do justice to what Jesus actually said. He said, Our Father. The word for father in Aramaic and Hebrew is the word Abba. Uh, the word Abba. Uh, and Abba, some of you have heard Abba means dad or daddy and, and uh, that kind of thing. And we will look at that a little bit. It didn't become reality to me until we were in Israel, uh, second or third trip, I think. We were... Uh, walking along the uh, coastline of the Mediterranean in a town called Caesarea, the ruins of Caesarea. It's a beautiful uh, location. But they had uh, dunes uh, on, the, uh, on the beach. And uh, I heard this little boy yelling, Abba, Abba, Abba. And he had gotten behind one of the dunes and he could no longer see his father. So he's yelling out, Abba, Abba, Abba. And I, all of a sudden it hit me, that is the Abba. We can cry out to him. And I thought, I learned so much from this little boy. But our Abba, I want to deal with two things right quick. Two things that... When we say our father, we, we need to grasp. Number one is this. Abba shows authority that leads to obedience. Abba shows authority that leads to obedience. Abba is more than daddy, okay? Uh, Abba is, we recognize when we look at a dad, he's, yes, he's close, but yet he's the authority in the family, 
right? He's the authority. He's the, the bottom line, and, and uh, he is that authority. So when Jesus says, our Father, what he's doing is he's recognizing that the God of all gods, he is the ultimate authority of everything. He is truth. He is authority. There is no other God. He is the Father in heaven. He is the authority. And what happens is we claim, along with saying our Father, we claim all of the uh, character and attributes of God. Let me give you some, and it's exhaustive. Number one is he's all-powerful. There is nothing uh, beyond him. Uh, I heard somebody say sometime, uh, if God is all-powerful, can he make a rock so big he can't lift? And I thought, yeah, but he wouldn't want to, is the way I look at it. And he's all-powerful. Second of all, he's all-knowing. He knows you intimately. He knows everything about you. He knows what's going on all over the world today. He, uh, he knows, and, and the next one is, he's ever-present. He's everywhere. He is the authority in Israel today and the battle that's going on, Israel and Hamas. He is in the Ukraine. He is in Haiti. He is everywhere, and he is here in this place. He is ever-present. And then we look at his character. He is full of love and compassion. He is greater than anything you're going to face. You hear what I said? He is greater than anything you're going to face. So, I look at it this way. If we're praying to a God who is not ultimately in, in control, what good is our prayer? We want to come before a God who's all authoritative. We want to come for a God that uh, and he is so massive that I can't help but shrink in his presence. I must submit to him. And so when the scripture says, our father, it means he is great. I am not. And so I must bow and submit to him. If, uh, if you were to uh, go out of here and you were on the access road of I-35 and you want to get on the highway, uh, you're going to merge on to the highway. Let me tell you something. You're not going to merge at your own uh, free will. You're not going to merge your own way. You're going to merge because the traffic on 35 is dictating the authority. And so you're going to have to adjust to merge onto the highway. When you come before Almighty God and you say, our Father, it means you're going to have to adjust your life accordingly. All right? Uh, In our country, we have what is called the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is the ultimate authority and decision makers. When they make a decision, no other court can change that decision. And I know it's a year of election and we're wondering what's going to be happening, but we have a group of of the Supreme Court that are all authority. I want you to know God is the ultimate Supreme Court. He is the ultimate that you will stand before someday. And he, when Jesus says, our Father, he is yeah, he's looking at his life and our life as we pray, and it puts us in the right position. So he's authoritative. Uh, second of all, Abba shows intimacy 
that leads to identity. Abba shows intimacy that leads to identity or uh, security. Uh, in my life, there are different relationships that I have. If I get something in the mail and it says resident, I know that person doesn't know me. They have my address, but they do not know me, okay? And, uh, but if I uh, get, talk to somebody and they call me uh, Mark Westerfield, they know of me, but they may not truly know of me. Um, uh, and then if they call me Reverend Westerfield, that means they know what I do, but they really don't know me uh, well. If they call me Pastor Mark, now we got a relationship. I know that they probably worship here, and we probably know each other, and it's a little bit closer uh, relationship. If they call me Mark, uh, it's a, a definite relationship, and it's a, a, a closeness that has developed, so we're a little closer. Now, if they call me dad, now we've shrunken down uh, uh, a little bit more. If they call me dad, I've got three children, they call me dad, uh, we know they have an intimate relationship. If they call me pops, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, my grandkids call me Pops, so uh, there's a closeness even closer that exists there. But if they call me Babe, <laughs> now we've gotten real close. I've only got three people in my life that call me. No, no, uh, no. My wife alone, I, I know what's going to happen at the door here. In the <laughs> People are going to call me babe. But, but, uh, but you see where I'm going in this. When we say Abba, Father, it means he is our father. There's an intimacy that exists. Maybe you can call him father today. Maybe you can't. But we have that closeness. And, and when you do not have your identity, you become insecure. And insecurity leads to mental health issues. It leads to depression. It leads to anger. It leads to lostness and lack of purpose. When you don't have your identity with the Heavenly Father... Let's say you got it in the world or finances or your job. You're going to find yourself struggling if you do not find it in your father. He is the heavenly father and he loves me intimately. Hey, here's something I want you to grab. He loves you unconditionally. What that means is you didn't earn it. Okay? Jesus died on the cross for you and when you put your faith in him, our father, we are adopted into his family. But you cannot earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. He loves you regardless. You need to hear that today. And he is working to grow you up and, to, and so that you can have security in him. Now, that's not always pleasant. My kids, our kids growing up, we had to get them stitches at times, shots at times. We had to take them to the doctor, not pleasant. We had to get on to them to discipline them. That's not always pleasant, but the deal is we want them to grow up to maturity. And so what Jesus is saying, 
When you say our Father, you're submitting to the authority and the intimacy, and He is going to do whatever it takes to grow you up. Amen? That's what He's going to do. That was hard for me to understand, that God would love me unconditionally. My children... Uh, had the privilege of going to Round Rock Christian Academy. But that was a privilege, except I was on the campus. And uh, that meant that uh, if they got in trouble, they got sent to my office. It wasn't fair. Uh, and, and this kind of thing. But my assistants always knew that my kids had priority. It didn't matter who I was meeting with, it didn't matter what was going on, if they showed up at the office, they had the freedom to go in to dad's office. And I don't know if some of you have experienced that. You probably thought, Mark's rude. I'm, I'm struggling with suicide here, and he's dealing with his kids. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm not the counselor for you at that point because my kids had priority and they had that intimacy with their dad that they could come. There's a story of a flight that was taking place and the, uh, the, the flight was really uh, turbulence bad. And there was a lady sitting by a little boy and the... Uh, the lady was just nervous. She was gonna, uh, she was crying. She thought the plane was going to go down. But the little boy was just calm as all get out. He was bouncing around. He was playing. And uh, she said, aren't you scared? And he said, no, I'm not scared. And she said, why aren't you scared? Why aren't you afraid of this turbulence and what's going on? And she said, I'm not afraid. You see, my dad is the pilot, and he will get us home safely. I want you to know, because of this intimacy with our Heavenly Father, life may get turbulent, it may get hard, but I know the pilot, and he will get us home safely. Okay? That's what he will do. So, Authority leads to obedience. Intimacy leads to a security and identity. I want to ask the worship team to come up as I uh, wrap this up and land the plane, so to speak. We want to help you in your prayer life. Two things I think could help you in your prayer life. One, last week, Brett challenge you to get a journal and put our daily bread and to list out the things you're praying for. And uh, that's great. And uh, I want to encourage you, take one page out of that journal and write down the attributes of God. He is creator. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He's loving. He's all of these things. He's the redeemer. He's the healer. And just jot these down and, and begin your prayer time by acknowledging who God is in your life. And when you're out walking or whatever, your prayer time, let worship songs or hymns just flow from you and acknowledge the goodness of God. This is the foundation. If we acknowledge God, then we have the faith to go forward. So reflect on the attributes of God. Uh, second of all, by faith, step out into the impossible realm. Uh, we want to pray Christmas uh, wish list. We just treat God like Santa Claus. Lord, make me healthy. Lord, do this, do that, give me money, give me a car, give me a, a husband or wife, uh, whatever. We just want to give him wish lists instead of, uh, sometime pray and not ask for anything. 
okay? Just worship him. But uh, by faith, step out into the apostle, apostle realm. He is greater than health issues. He is greater than addiction and the flesh. He is greater than war and world crisis. Acknowledges God, our Father, you are ultimate authority. But you're not only authority out there, you're so close as my next breath. Abba, Father.